Hello and good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us here today. And we hope that you are healthy and well. Today's webinar is being hosted by the Muse Middlesex County's Entrepreneurial Community, which houses resources and co-working space for startups, entrepreneurs, and small as well as micro independent businesses that are looking for collaboration, information, and space for growth. Uh, we are happy to welcome the leadership team here from the Middlesex County Chamber of Commerce, President Larry McHugh, Vice President Johanna Bond, and Vice President Jeff Puglis, to walk us through the resources that are available to the entrepreneurial community, helping us weather this COVID-19 shutdown, as well as to ready ourselves for the recovery. My name is Rebecca Mead, and I am working with the team here at the Muse, and we'll be moderating today's webinar. And as I'm sure many of you are now Zoom experts, given all of the webinars that we're having, um, I'll go through just a few housekeeping items before we begin. As we have a very full house, um, all participants are on listen-only mode, but we do welcome questions. So please either use the Q&A or chat feature to pose your questions, and we'll address them toward the end of our time together today. And if you have any trouble seeing or hearing us, Raise your hand um, and I'll assist you as um, the webinar progresses. So that's about it on my end. I'd love to get started and um, we'll begin with a man who needs no introduction, Chamber President Larry McHugh. Thanks, Larry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. You did a great job on this and uh, thank you for all of you that are joined uh, uh, this uh, call today on, on Zoom. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your uh, interest and uh, more importantly, uh, your businesses being uh, located uh, throughout the central Connecticut region and uh, Middlesex County in particular. Our chamber, as you know, is the uh, largest chamber in the state of Connecticut, uh, but the growth of this chamber is going to come from all of you that are on this uh, uh, Zoom call today. Uh, we feel that uh, we have really uh, tried to address as quickly as possible this COVID-19 uh, difficulty that's facing every one of us in this community. Uh, as we uh, strive to open up our businesses and move forward in a, a more aggressive manner in the next few months, uh, we want to be able to touch base with all of you, uh, give you what the Chamber has done so far and what we continue to do in the future. Just to remind you, the Chamber is here for you. The Chamber is with you. The Chamber is dedicated to your business. We need you. We need you to stay strong and we need you to stay safe. It gives me a great honor now to introduce uh, my leadership team, uh, Johanna Bond and Jeff uh, Puglis, who will take this over from now on to go over all the different uh, opportunities that you have with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coach. I think I'll uh, take it from here to start. Good afternoon, everybody. Jeff Puglis with the Middlesex County Chamber of Commerce. Certainly thrilled to be with you all today. Just want to thank my friend Rebecca for putting together this excellent webinar here and all of you who are on the, the Zoom meeting today. Uh, the Muse Plus is something we're very invested in through the Middlesex County Chamber of Commerce. It's really our effort to develop a true innovation ecosystem headquartered in Middletown, but really that truly has a county reach. And we'll talk a little bit more about what role we believe the Muse will play as we transition from mitigation to recovery here moving forward in Middlesex County. So just to give you a brief perspective from my point of view here, the Chamber has been working extra hard for you around the clock really, trying to be a resource and trying to do everything we can to support the business community in Middlesex County. And we will continue to do that through the resolution of this very difficult COVID-19 situation and certainly beyond. Um, so the Chamber is fully operational. Uh, we have the ability to have our staff working from home and working remotely, which they are doing and they're doing a wonderful job. I have to credit Johanna's leadership for that. She's doing an awesome job leading our staff and making sure everybody's on the same page and that they continue to be productive and supportive of the business community. And she'll talk a little bit more about those efforts when we uh, transition into her portion of the program here. Uh, but my role has largely been external. And what that means is staying in constant touch, daily communication with all key stakeholders throughout the Middlesex County community, and most importantly, public officials at the local, state, and indeed the federal levels. Uh, again, that means daily calls with folks such as the mayor of the city of Middletown, all of our resident first select men and first select women throughout Middlesex County. They truly have an, a unique sense of what's going on on the ground within these individual business communities throughout Middlesex County. So it's very important for us to kind of really collect that real time data and intelligence from throughout the county. And that allows us to best support you, best support our membership and best support the community at large. So just a couple of uh, examples of that. 
Uh, in Middletown, as you know, the chamber is headquartered in Middletown. We very much have a true county reach, but our headquarters is in Middletown and we have a, a very strong and long-standing relationship with the city of Middletown. Um, so we have been engaging Larry and myself in daily calls with Mayor Ben Florsheim and every key stakeholder represented throughout the city of Middletown. That's everybody from the leadership team at Middlesex Health, which is truly on the front lines of this public health crisis. We know at the chamber that this first and foremost is a public health crisis. We know our role and part of that role is to kind of stay out of the professional's way, those who are truly mitigating this public health crisis on the front line. But we know our role is also to try to mitigate the damage to the economy because the economy is so important to all of us, not only in Middlesex County, not only throughout our state, but throughout our country and indeed throughout the world. So we appreciate the, the leadership of Mayor Florsheim and the city of Middletown and all the folks that jump on that call. Again, from Middlesex Health Leadership to police and fire, to folks who are providing support for uh, the neediest among us in our community, uh, seniors, those who are among the homeless population. We need to make sure we look out for everybody now. More, it's more important now than ever to look out for everybody. And again, our role is, of course, to try to mitigate the economic damage here. So we're talking about how we're working to insulate our membership, insulate our business community as best we can and make sure we're well positioned to come back, not only come back, but come back very, very strong. So that's really what we're trying to do on the local level. And really that extends throughout Middlesex County beyond the borders of the city of Middletown. Uh, on the state side, we're also staying in constant touch with all of our partners at the state level. That includes the entire General Assembly, most notably our Middlesex County Legislative Delegation. We're very fortunate to have 16 members of the Connecticut General Assembly that represent Middlesex County up in Hartford in both the Senate and the House. And we have a great working relationship with all of them. We're very lucky to have this delegation because it's a very strong delegation. Not only does it represent both parties, it represents both chambers of the legislature. They have a lot of folks that have key leadership roles uh, through the legislature and also have key committee chairmanships, uh, which are really important to the business community at this time. So we've stayed in constant touch with them. But as you know, the legislature is now in recess. And the most important entity within the state government is the governor's office and, of course, the entire executive branch. So uh, our most closely communication is with the Department of Economic and Community Development. We are in daily contact with Commissioner Lehman, Deputy Commissioner Thames, and their entire team. We're trying to be a resource for them on the ground as they work to really mitigate this massive economic problem in the state of Connecticut. And we will continue to be a resource uh, for DECD and for all of our members. On the labor side, we're also doing our best to stay up to date on everything coming out of the Department of Labor, uh, out of the Department of Revenue Services. There are some important tax changes that have been announced at the federal and the state level that businesses of all shapes and sizes and uh, from all industry sectors can truly take advantage of. And we have that information and a lot of that information is on our website and Johanna is doing a great job compiling that. And again, she'll go through some of the particulars of our coronavirus toolkit and some of the things that she's been working on with the support of our wonderful staff. Um, I did mention the legislature. So the legislature is constitutionally mandated to close their regular session on May 6th. And so it looks like at this point, they have been adjourned since mid-March and they will not go back in for regular business until after uh, the constitutionally required close of session, which is May 6th. So that means they'll probably go back into a special session um, at some point where it's uh, you know, permitted for them to do so, and it's uh, kind of taking into account the health and wellness of everybody, not only the legislature, the members themselves, but the large numbers of staff, the staff members that they have up in Hartford. So we do expect a special session at some point, perhaps into the summer, and we don't expect a wide scope of business from that special session. We expect it to be really focused on COVID-19 relief, and we really expect it to be limited in scope. As you know, this is an election year. So as we get further and further away from the end of a regular session and closer to the election, uh, the political dynamics change a little bit. So I think they're gonna try to get their business done as early as possible, as long as they're safely able to do so. So we will certainly keep an eye on that. Those of you who may be wondering, the Rainy Day Fund, uh, which is a fund that the state of Connecticut has been building over the past couple of years to try to uh, shore up the state's finances in the event of an emergency. Well, I think it's fair to say that it's raining outside. This is a, an emergency on the economic side, so we can't expect some action on that front. So our legislative committee continues to be very engaged and active, and we will certainly stay all over that and share that real-time data with our members as it comes in. On the federal side, we continue to stay in touch with our entire Middlesex County federal delegation. That means both of our United States senators, Senator Blumenthal and Senator Murphy. And also we have three members of Congress, the House of Representatives that represent our service area. That's Congressman John Larson in the first con congressional district, Congressman Joe Courtney in the second, and Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro in the third. 
We're staying in constant touch with all of them. In fact, we've done webinars or have webinars scheduled with all of them. Uh, really, it's been focusing on the CARES Act, which I'll get to in a minute. And then Johanna can show you how to access those webinars that have been all been recorded and are available to you as we move forward on our website. I mentioned the CARES Act quickly, and I'll wrap up here in a moment. But the CARES Act, as you know, was signed into law on March 27th. The full name is the Coronavirus Aid and Economic Relief Security Act, and short for the CARES Act. Uh, three components are really what we're focusing on coming out of this major piece of federal stimulus legislation. One is the Paycheck Protection Program. One is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, or the EIDL. And another is a series of tax credits that are available for the business community. As you know, this was about a trillion dollar bill and the need is so massive that the programs, the appropriations that are funding the PPP and the EIDL have now lapsed. They are out of money. So we have been pushing very hard from a chamber perspective, working with our federal partners to make sure they get back into session and really provide additional resources into these critical funds moving forward. We need a fourth round of stimulus federal legislation and we need it right now. The chamber had a board meeting on Thursday and there was a unanimous motion which was passed and they, want the, they wanted the staff to develop a letter to go to the entire Connecticut congressional delegation and we wanted to stress the importance of additional federal stimulus legislation because the need for the business community is immediate and it is massive. That letter was sent on Friday and we got some very good responses over the weekend from our members of Congress and we're expecting some legislative movement maybe as soon as today. I know negotiations are underway as we are conducting this webinar here. So we, suppose, we really hope to have some uh, great news for you on that front in very short order. And we will share the particulars of that very quickly. We're also making sure that there aren't massive changes made to these application processes. We know that folks have been spending a lot of time gathering their financials and kind of following the parameters that were laid out by the federal government for the Paycheck Protection Program and for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. So we're really pushing that there aren't major changes made and major tweaks made to the application process because that could really further delay the uh, remittance of these funds which the business community needs really badly. Uh, beyond pushing for immediate action at the federal and state levels, we're supporting our members and business members uh, at large through technical assistance. We're supporting them as they gather their applications and really put together relief applications for the programs that are available to them, whether that's PPP, EIDL, tax credits, or perhaps even at the state level through the DECD bridge loan program, which again is unfortunately oversubscribed at this point, which again points to the massive need that is out there for the business community. But if you need any assistance in kind of figuring out the differences between these programs, uh, you know, some of the best practices that you should employ and how to go about applying for them, please reach out to either Johanna or myself and one of us will get back to you and make sure that if we don't have the answer and we're getting better at this, but we're certainly not experts and we don't have the answer, we have some great resources through the chamber and we can provide those answers to you in very short order. I know there's been a concern since this is a Muse call, uh, we have a lot of micro businesses and entrepreneurs on here, I'm sure. I know there's been a lot of concern of late of household proprietors and freelancers and kind of uh, real solopreneurs even, really micro businesses, small businesses without payrolls per se, how they go about accessing some of these relief funds and we can help you work through that process as well. Uh, so as I wrap up here, I think uh, as we kind of um, transition from a mitigation plan to an economic recovery plan, you can see behind Johanna, she has her new relaunch logo and she'll get into exactly how the chamber plans to approach that relaunch plan because she's doing a great job leading that effort. Uh, but it really will be a multi-pronged approach in terms of partnering with all of our external partners for the local, state, and the federal level. We need to A, push for additional relief, which we're doing on a daily basis. We plan to continue to provide direct business counseling, not only with, uh, in terms of accessing relief packages that are available, but helping folks develop business plans, develop business recovery plans, um, you know, really kind of harden the defenses of their business. We're calling it economic resilience. It's something that we've been working on for a while, uh, but this plan was really kind of dwarfed by the massive problem that COVID-19 has presented. But we'll be working with folks to develop emergency response and economic resilience plans to try to really harden their defenses against the many threats that may face them beyond pandemics, but anything from weather to cyber to anything else that may have uh, uh, the potential to have a negative impact on businesses and the business community. Another uh, prong or another component of this recovery plan will be workforce development. We need to make sure we're an active and engaged and effective bridge between job seekers and employers as we work to 
mitigate some of the economic damage that is resulting from COVID-19. We'll be working with employers that are hiring and job seekers. We know we'll have a lot, of, a lot more job seekers than we've had in the past. The economy was really cruising along pretty well. So we'll, we'll, we're certain to have a major need on the workforce development side and will certainly be a key resource for both the employer community and for the job seeker community. And finally, I'll close with just some thoughts on the Muse Plus here, the organization that is hosting this call. We expect the Muse Plus and entrepreneur development initiatives throughout the state to play a really key role as we move forward. A lot of these folks who unfortunately are losing employment, I think a lot of them have an entrepreneurial streak and may decide to, to give a, starting a business a shot. Uh, we have a lot of folks that have been economically injured that are in, small, in the small business world, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, freelancers, all of those folks. The Muse Plus will be a resource for them. The Muse stands for Middletown Entrepreneurs Workspace, and we're looking to rebrand that into Middlesex Entrepreneurs Workspace as we move this program forward. We want to really make sure we have a countywide reach. The space itself is located on the second floor of the Chamber's headquarters, 393 Main Street in Middletown. It's a fully functioning co-working space, and that is available to our members if they want to get out of the house, get out of the coffee shop, out of their garage, and we can really get them kind of engaging in a real collaborative co-working environment. So that's one component of it. The plus part of the Muse Plus is all of the related entrepreneur support activity that we run out of the space as our innovation ecosystem headquarters. So that includes professional office hours, that includes a number of uh, great events that Rebecca and Susan and Tim are putting together, pitch competitions, um, things of that nature. We have an outstanding leads group, we have lunch and learns, we, have, we are chock full of resources at the Muse and we plan to take this program to the next level starting with our next fiscal year, which begins on July 1st, and you'll have more information on that front it is forthcoming. But we wanna make sure that we're a resource to businesses of all shapes and sizes, from Fortune 500 companies down to solopreneurs, and that's what the Chamber's focus will be moving forward. So I look forward to the Q&A portion of this, and I'll kick it over to Johanna, who's doing a wonderful job in support of the business community here in Middlesex County. JB, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. And I do apologize if you saw me on my cell phone. Uh, Larry somehow got kicked off. We're trying to get him back on, so I've been texting with him. So uh, let's see if we can get him back on. Uh, so I'm so glad that you're all here today. I think this is great. Uh, it's great that Jeff and I are able to kind of share what's going on, what we're doing. So one of the key things that I want to share with you, and I'm just going to share my screen for a sec. If I do this correctly. All right. Do you all see this, Rebecca, Jeff? All right. Yes, we can. Uh, so this is our coronavirus toolkit. We started this back uh, probably about a month ago when, when we started seeing what was going to be happening. So really, this is all about just trying to put the latest information out there for our members to get for DOL, for the PPP, whatever it is. This is updated on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. So please continue to check this up because there's a lot of great content and good information here. As just stated, we had some previous workshops that we held. If you notice down here to the right, um, you can find a link to watch all of those workshops, some great information there. So you can always check that out as well. Um, one of the other key things that we started was our shouted out campaign. I just want to share that with you real quick. This is through Facebook. Uh, it's our great campaign. We have over 1,200 followers right now. If you notice, uh, all day we've got amazing companies just posting the different great things they're doing, store hours, specials. It's really a huge hit. And it really is a great way for a lot of our members and our members alike to communicate what they're doing and how they're making a difference. Uh, so those are just two things I wanted to share with you real quick. I definitely would advise you to check that out. I know you probably feel <clears throat> inundated by the emails that we send you every day, but we're trying to bring you the most up-to-date information and links available. So all that information can be found on those emails as well. Um, we also have a restaurant tab on our website. That is also updated. Uh, I don't know for those of you in Middletown, Eli's just opened up yesterday. That was one that had closed down right after this happened, but they reopened. So we're continually updating the, the restaurant tab as well. If you go on there, you'll find it by town. So you can go on there and it clicks right to their website so you can get the latest information. One of the other key things that we did in the beginning was our small business survey. Uh, we are still accepting people to uh, apply for that. But I, we literally had over 65 surveys come in within the first two and a half weeks. And we got great, great feedback. And thank you for those that did. Because um, that's really trying to help us form what we're doing going forward. Uh, you know, a lot of what we've done is kind of try to take a, a lot of information and, and put it into a small amount 
um, of meetings so that you guys can, can really have great opportunities to ask questions. So that leads us to the, the town hall style webinars that we've done. Uh, for those of you who've been there, we've done one with Senator Blumenthal, Congressman Courtney. Uh, we've got one this Friday with Congressman Larson, so sign up today for that. And uh, then we've had representatives from Connecticut Small Business Development Center. What's key about these is the fact that you're able to ask those questions that, that you, know, you really need to answer. You know, Jeff and I have been fielding calls, emails, doing our best, um, and, and definitely guiding our members to the right places to find that information. But sometimes having that opportunity to ask that question and get that direct answer right there is so beneficial to you, which is why we, we set these up. So I do encourage you to take advantage of those. Also, I, again, I encourage you to go on the website, check out the, the tape links because you'll find some great information in there. Um, so with that being said, we also have our Tuesday tips with experts. So we started that about three weeks ago. Uh, it focuses on we've got two law firms that participate, uh, UKS and Pullman and Conley. Uh, they've done a few in a row. We had the CARES Act of bite-sized portions. Last week, we did one looking ahead, getting back to business. And today I've got one at two, so I'm gonna jump off a little bit early. Uh, planning strategies, looking beyond the current crisis. So now we're really trying to em embrace what, what's going on and move forward. How can we help our members go forward? So if you have any ideas on things that you wanna hear about, please let us know, shoot us an email, uh, or give us a text, call us on the phone, we're, we're always willing to talk, even if it's eight o'clock at night, we're always up working, so just definitely call. Uh, we do have a great workshop on Monday. It's part of our Key Bank workshop series, and it's focused on how to deal with online webinar platforms. So we're gonna be talking about Zoom, WebEx, you know, all the different platforms that are out there, and really how to utilize them the best, how to have security, um, what is the best option for your company. So I definitely would say take advantage of that because I know there's been a lot of questions. I feel like um, I've been a Zoom trainer and I'm just learning Zoom myself. I mean, I've certainly been able to master a little bit of it, but I, I'm doing daily calls with people on how to use Zoom. So this is a great opportunity for get hands-on information. And again, ask those questions directly to the people who know. So I started a new thing last week, which we've talked about for a, quite a while, um, doing podcasts. And so I did one with our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our chairman, Don DeVivo. And we'll be doing one a week going forward, and it's gonna focus on all of our divisions, committees, and councils. So it's more of a, what are we doing? What are they doing? How are they working? What are they working on? It's more of an informational series for you to listen to. So please take advantage of that. That will be released probably at the beginning of May. So we're very excited about that. Uh, obviously, as you know, the chambers, committees, and councils have been very active. Every meeting is still part of Zoom, but each council has taken on a different role. So example, our HR council, they're working really hard with what I'll be describing to you in a minute for our relaunch program. You know, the healthcare council, we're actually putting a wellness well-being toolkit on there that will be launched on Thursday. That kind of gives people some meditation things, exercises you can do from home, different options you can do to keep up your health and, and wellness. So definitely watch for that. But you know, they're really the grassroots of our, our, our organization and they help guide us. So we do appreciate that, uh, but definitely check for that. One of the other key things that I Jeff described to you before is our relaunch program. So relaunch is really, our mission is to serve as a catalyst to assist the Middlesex Chamber community with recovering, emerging from COVID-19 through innovation, communication, and collaboration. There will be several areas that we're gonna focus on. We're gonna focus on communication PR, marketing, regulation and legal, financial and funding, obviously workforce development and retention, human resource, and then best business practices. So part of what re relaunch is going to be is uh, it's really pooling together all the best resources that we can find to help you guys get back on your feet. You know, whether it's webinars that we're gonna do with people who specialize in marketing, how to do that. We're gonna have communication pieces to teach you how do you get your customers back. Um, with HR, it's all about, okay, you need new employee handbooks. There's a myriad of things that are gonna be part of this. This is gonna be a really big project, but we're really excited because this is looking forward and we're gonna do our best to get all of our information in one place for you guys to utilize. So with that being said, you know, if there's any innovative ideas that you have or have done, we'd love to hear about that. You know, I mean, we're hearing about, you know, keeping doors open once you go back into work, all these things. But there's a lot of things that are just still the unknown. So we're trying our best to bring all the best information to you. Um, honestly, it's been a very uh, different time. I think, you know, we all know that, but, you know, as, as, you know, I think Rebecca said earlier, 
about something, we're all up to the challenge. You know, we're here, we're a member organization, we're here to support you in any way, shape that we can. Um, so, you know, but we need your support as well. We need to know what you need from us. So if you have any suggestions at any time or anything you think we should try to do differently, we're always open for more. So that's a wrap for me. I guess we can open the questions and answers. So if anyone has any questions, they can certainly raise their hand and I'll open up the audio so that we can have this more of as a conversation. Any questions? Well, Mike Danello did say that he loves the relaunch logo. He was a little concerned about the sword logo that was over Larry's shoulder. <laughs> Hopefully it didn't fall on him and that's why he had to get off. No. <laughs> I'll just, uh, while we wait for some questions to come in, Rebecca, if you don't mind, I see that one of our participants is from a, a great partner organization of ours, Workforce Alliance. Mm -hmm. And Anna and I both touched uh, briefly on some of our workforce development efforts. Uh, but one of the links within the coronavirus toolkit and the uh, mass emails that are sent out from the chamber on a pretty much a daily basis is a, a survey that was put together by Workforce Alliance. If folks have the time and the ability to go in, it's a very short survey, but they're very important questions. Workforce Alliance, for those of you who don't know, is the South Central Workforce Investment Board in the state of Connecticut. They have a 30 town service area, which includes all of Middlesex County. So they're a really important partner of ours from uh, everything from job fairs to youth employment to direct workforce development to supporting the American Job Centers. There's one in Middletown actually. Um, I would just recommend uh, you know either going to workforcealliance.biz or going to our website and checking out that survey. It's really important data that they're collecting and also just to give them a shout out. They're doing really good work in this time and they're another really effective bridge between job seekers and employers. So I figured I'd share that as we wait for some questions. Yeah, uh, Joanna just uh, shared it with everyone in the chat. So the link to the survey is in there directly. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Come on, guys, ask us some questions. That's now you got us group. on the rope. <laughs> no questions? Okay, I did get a question. Um, uh, one attendee said, my staff is collecting unemployment. So what is the process to switch to PPP? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that again, Rebecca? Sure, uh, John Greeno asked, my staff is collecting unemployment. So what is the process to switch to PPP? Well, I mean, you have to officially apply for PPP through an SBA partner lender. And we have some within Middlesex County and within our membership. It's most effective to go through the bank that you have an existing business banking relationship with. And hopefully in John's case, he has a, an existing business banking relationship with an SBA lender that is um, able to and has the technological uh, ability to entertain PPP applications. If not, then we can certainly help him offline. But um, even though right now, because the funding has lapsed, the portals are closed, there's still information out there on the SBA website and on different banks' website on how to put together the beginnings of a PPP application and what you'll need to gather and put together. Once the uh, portal is reopened, it's really going to be a first come first serve basis. So I encourage everybody who's interested in applying for PPP to be ready. Folks who have applied and were in the system and, uh, and then of course the funding lapse, so they shut down the portal. We've been encouraging with the partnership of our delegation to make sure SBA honors everybody what's in what's called the e-trans system. So once you were approved by your bank and they've affirmed that you have submitted a successful and complete application and they send it on to SBA, you're in what's called the e-trans system. And our partners within our federal delegation are trying to get those applications honored first and clear out that pipeline and then open up the portal to have new applications come in. So I'm happy to help John um, offline one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but it does have to be, in terms of PPP, it really has to be 75% going towards payroll expenses, and then the remaining balance, the other 25% can go towards things like utilities and rent and other qualified business expenses. 
uh, but he should really begin the process of looking into the parameters of a PPP application and getting ready to really be able to click submit as soon as that portal gets reopened once the next wave of stimulus re uh, legislation is signed into law. Thanks, Jeff. I, <clears throat> okay, I had another question. Excuse me. Being in the hospitality business along with others here in Eastern Connecticut, how can the chamber help with your proposed marketing strategies to help draw people from other areas and states to bring back revenues to the businesses that we help support? All right, that's, that's a neat question. <laughs> um, hi, Mike. So, you know, that's a, that's a great question, but what we're doing now is part of what relaunch really is, it's gonna go twofold. So for those of you who don't know, um, I also serve as the executive director of the Central Regional Tourism District, which we are the admin arm of at the chamber. So we're trying to do this actually with the Central Regional Tourism District, Michael, because it's so important. And I mean, we've gotten stats that are staggering that I received today. Um, and I couldn't believe what I, what I saw. But uh, pay, stay tuned because we do have a marketing meeting today for the tourism district at four. And uh, there's, a, there's a big plan to kind of incorporate what we're doing here at the chamber into some plan for our central regional tourism district, which you're part of. So uh, I, you know, I don't have the answer right now, but trust me, we are working on it. We've got some great team members that are part of, uh, you know, experts in their field that are, are working with us. So we definitely will have more information. And we do, uh, for Michael, for you specifically, I'm gonna forward you an email that one of our members attended uh, a Zoom through TripAdvisor. There was actually two great information that I will share with you. It was all taped, so I'll send that to you this afternoon so you can review that because there was really good information there for you. Um, but just stay tuned. And if you have any ideas, you wanna be part of this, I mean, I know you're on the district, but if you wanna be part of a conversation, I would love to have you. Thank you. We and, do have a question. Uh, just a quick shout out. Thank you, Ella, for the shout out about shout out. <laughs> shout it out. Uh, we appreciate that and we're gonna keep it going, we promise. So thank you. Super. That sounded um, staged, Rebecca. It wasn't. It was genuine. <laughs> um, is there information on whether HVAC systems will need to be re redesigned or have special filters as we restart businesses in multi-occupancy facilities? Wow. Um, that's the first I've heard of that, but I must say it's a great question. Uh, you know, we all know that the the COVID uh, virus is, is respiratory in nature. So um, that's a great question. I believe Roberto asked that from Shooting mm -hmm. Chocolates, a great downtown yeah. establishment in Middletown. Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but we will look into that, Roberto, and certainly get back to you because that's a really, really good question. All right. Um, we have a question from Megan LaFontaine who says, I've been working with Liberty Bank to complete my PPP application. Signed it last Wednesday and received an email with a complete signed application, but the bank portal still says that it's incomplete. I've called Liberty Bank several times and can't get an answer as to what's going on. So is there any help we can give to intervene there? Well, uh, yeah, we'll call Megan after the, the webinar here and try to assist her uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, I'm not sure what the issue is there. It sounds like, like I said, you really have to get into that eTran portal. And if the bank system is kicking it back as incomplete, it does not sound like, sound like just from this conversation that she's in there. Um, so, but we'll look into that and um, just let Megan know that we'll give her a call right after this webinar. To talk it out. Super. I think you just did. <laughs> okay. True. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um. I think we've covered all the questions that have been asked so far. Um, I don't see any additional ones. If you do have them, please please submit them so that we can get them answered for you. Oh, here we go. Uh, John Greeno says that we have applied and been accepted. Some staff will now earn more than their current salary with that $600 bonus from the federal government. Mm -hmm. What's the advantage to the employee? What's the advantage to the employee by going through PPP? To, or go back to work. I'm assuming, right, John? He's saying that some staff will earn more than their current salary with the $600 bonus. It's the email I sent you this morning, Jeff. Okay, well. Oh, to go to PPP, yes. Okay, 
Um, you know, I don't know specifically. I would say that because of the eight week requirement, once you receive the PPP, you know, you have that eight week window to deploy those funds to payroll. I don't know how that would overlap with what their current unemployment schedule is. Um, but if you don't, I will say, if you don't apply for PPP and you're in, unsuccessful in getting any relief funds through that or other programs, and the unemployment is exhausted, you won't really have a lot of resources to bring them back on after the fact. Um, so I think there is a way to extend out the relief by combining the time frame of the unemployment along with the PPP, but without knowing the schedules of when they started collecting the unemployment and when the application um, was submitted for PPP and when that would begin, you know, we need to get a, a better sense of what that schedule looks like. So we should talk to John after the fact. And just real quick, I'm part of the Chamber of Commerce Professionals on Facebook page, and I know the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, this has come up repeatedly, and I actually just sent Jeff an email this morning about this exact conversation, because there's a lot of companies out there who are saying, well, they're not going to want to come back to work if they're making that much more money than they are if they're working. So it's a big dilemma for a lot of companies, and I can just tell you that I know the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is working really hard to address it. Um, at their level, so we'll pay attention very closely to that and keep you updated as uh, what happens with that as well. And if the unemployment eventually is exhausted and the business doesn't have the means to bring you back, then even if you were making more money during the period when you were on federal support or public support, then it might not be the best play in the long term if yeah. the business doesn't have the means to bring you back on. So I think you should take a, a more of a comprehensive look than you know, just doing the math for a, a four to eight week period of what, how you'd be bringing in more money. There's a lot of difficult decisions and confusing decisions out there. They really are. Mm -hmm. We understand. Uh, we have a question from Roberto. Uh, do we have a channel to ask TripAdvisor, Yelp, or Google to change from posted hours to by appointment? I can help him with that. I will call you after. Probably not today because I have back-to-back -back Zooms, uh, but I will definitely get back to you tomorrow. I can help you with that. Great. Thanks. Any other additional questions? Feel free to ask them through chat, through the Q&A, or raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll open up your mic. Hi, Wanda, go ahead with your question. Yep. You have to unmute yourself. I think you're still on mute. Wanda is the partner with Workforce Alliance that I mentioned. So I imagine it's workforce in nature. I think she needs to unmute her. There we go. Hi, so how are you all today? And, and, and thank you, um, uh, Jeff, um, for all the wonderful work that uh, you are doing. And, and we appreciate your um, providing us with the opportunity to uh, get our survey questions um, out there. And uh, it's just more of a comment than, than a question. Um, we appreciate um, all that you're, you're doing in terms of helping all those businesses um, in Middlesex County um, understand um, the resources that are available to them from not only a workforce development uh, perspective, but also from a, a business perspective. So I just wanted to kind of congratulate the Middlesex Chamber of Commerce on all that they've been doing in order to help uh, the small businesses out there. So thank you and keep up the excellent uh, work. Thank you, Wanda. We appreciate that. We've been saying that we can't necessarily promise all the results, but we'll promise maximum effort and we'll continue. Yeah, 100%. To I see a question, a question from Mike yeah. there. Uh, I could take it if you want, Rebecca. I know you have touched on the state's rainy day fund. Is there a bipartisan proposal on if and how these funds may be spread out? Can this fund be used for private help as well as municipal help? 
It's a great question, Mike. I haven't seen any legislation that has been crafted as of yet. Um, like I said, what I think they're going to try to do is get towards the end of the state's fiscal year um, and try to get a better sense of how the tax receipts are coming in and get a better sense of what the state's fiscal health looks like as we go into the next fiscal year. As you know, the state is required to close each budget year with a balanced budget. Um, it's not like the federal government where they can continue on with deficit spending. So the state will have to close their budget for the fiscal year that they're in now uh, with a balance with a balanced budget, whether that's through a combination of um, I don't think they can do revenue increases now, of course, but you know spending cuts or pulling from the rainy day fund or some other um, you know creative budgetary uh, procedures that they've engaged in in the past. So I haven't heard anything yet that's being crafted. I imagine that it will be bipartisan in nature. Um, we have seen you know it really been encouraged by a lot of the political labels being thrown out the window at the local state and. Maybe not so much the federal level, but I think they're, they're maybe getting there, hopefully. Um, but I do expect a bipartisan, some kind of COVID-related bipartisan package that will come out of the state legislature in a special session, probably in the summer, maybe even in June, if they want to do it before the close of this fiscal year. Uh, but I do expect it to be bipartisan, and I do expect the governor's office to be very engaged in those conversations as well. Thanks, Jeff. And in terms of, uh, I left one out, I guess, can those funds be used for uh, private support? I mean, I, I imagine they have the ability legally to redeploy those funds into some kind of mitigation package. Um, whether they will do that or not, I, I don't know. But I don't think there's anything tying their hands where they can't use what's in the rainy day fund uh, for whatever legislation they come up with. I don't think it's necessarily a restricted fund. Thanks. We do have a question from Mark Epright. He asks, will people who are receiving unemployment and the bonus 600 be removed if a business offers the job back to them? And if they don't come back, can they be replaced and meet the requirements under PPP for the employer? Okay, yes. Let me read that again. Yeah, please, if you don't okay. mind. Okay. Yeah. So, will people who are receiving unemployment and the bonus 600 be removed if a business offers the job back to them? And if they don't come back, can they be replaced and meet the requirements under PPP for the employer? They can be replaced. I know that. They can be replaced, yes, yeah. and then meet the requirements of how you deploy the PPP funds. Correct. Like I said, there's that 75-25 ratio there on PPP. In terms of whether they will be removed from unemployment if the business offers them the job back and they don't come back, um, I don't know the official answer to that, yeah. but we'll, ha we'll have to get that. I don't know if Wanda's still on. Perhaps she can weigh in. That's probably more of a DOL question than a workforce board question. Um, but I don't know the exact answer to that, but we will certainly find that out. And we're working to, most of our webinars have been business focused, of course, because obviously we're a chamber of commerce, but we're getting more and more questions on the labor side. So I think that, um, you know, we'll probably have some content more geared towards the labor side in the coming days and weeks. Um, Wanda, if you unmute yourself, go ahead. You can, there you Hi. go. Um, I do not know the official answer to that because it's much more complicated than that because of all the unemployment um, guidelines that uh, governs when a person is actually called back from being on unemployment insurance. So it gets to be a more complicated. So I will have to research it and defer that question to a later webinar. And so I can certainly um, provide you with some input on a later date. And we're fortunate to have some great contacts at DOL. So we will I'll take a, a screenshot of that question and try to get some feedback. And we did reach out to DOL, just so you know, to try to see if we can get somebody to do a webinar in the future. Great, thanks. Thanks, Wanda. We, um, we have a question from Brianna. Um, any discussion on rent relief if, a, if businesses need to be closed for lengthy periods of time due to the COVID? Mm. Well, there are some governor's uh, executive orders that deal with rent relief and tenant support. Um, I think you'll see a lot more of them coming out. I think eventually they'll have to, they'll have to be a legislative solution. 
whether that's at the federal or the state level. I don't know how long they can go with just relying on the executive orders. I mean, they essentially have the force of law, but I think to really have, um, you know, the full backing of the law and be uh, kind of immune or uh, protected against a lot of legal challenges, there'll have to be a legislative solution. Uh, but I know, and we can send you, Brianna, I can send you some of the executive orders that deal specifically with uh, tenant support and rent relief. We have those um, kind of sectioned off uh, in our files here. So I'll send Brianna that after the fact. I think there's some good information there. I think it's, um, you know, there's a, a back end to it. There's a time limit to it. Uh, but I imagine there'll be an extension on that from the uh, governor's office. And then again, there has to be some kind of legislative solution in the long run. Wanda, did you want to add something? Just need to unmute yourself. No comment. Oh, okay. Thanks, Wanda. And Johanna, on that last piece, I know that one of the Tuesday tips with Updi Kelly and Spellacy dealt with tenant law. It did. Uh, it was last Tuesday's. So, yeah. Brianna, perhaps there's a link in the uh, toolkit that Johanna walked you through before. And there should be a link to the one with Updi Kelly and Spellacy that dealt with tenant law and some other things, uh, best practices for tenants uh, and landlords alike. So, I would suggest that you take a look at that link. It was very informative. And then we'll also good. work to get you some uh, specific data through the governor's orders. Thank you. I think that's all the questions I've received so far. Any additional ones at this time? I think that's it for now. Jeff, Joanna. Okay. Then of course, if we miss any, we will make sure to respond to you personally after Absolutely. the webinar. And you can find Jeff and my contact right on the Chamber website. If you have any further questions or anything specific you wanna ask, please by all means do reach out. Absolutely. So Jeff, anything more you'd like to add before we I mean, I just echo Johanna's right, comments. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that this webinar, I hope this webinar has proven to everybody that we're doing the best we can and that we do have a lot of the answers, not all of them, but if we don't have them, we'll work to get them for you. We are very fortunate to have a vast network of resources, both in the private and public and nonprofit sectors. And uh, we're using those now more than ever. So I'll just say, be well, continue to lean on the chamber and the other resources that are available to all of you. And we hope to see you in person real soon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's so true. Thank, thank you, you all for taking the time. Yep, thank you very much. And we will send out the recording. So if there's any bits that you missed or you'd like to share this with a colleague, please feel free to do that. And we do appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.